Today on In Grace, we're gonna to continue to tell my dad's life story. And although he was a good man, he's not in heaven today because of his good works. I never expected to be standing at a cemetery where my dad was buried when I began to tell the story of his life. My dad was well known for his preaching on television. Every week, many of you heard him speak boldly about the way God expects us to live. And we're living in a wicked world. And everybody says, man, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It does matter. You also heard him say that salvation from hell to heaven is a free gift and it's not of works. And he died in my place. The only way old, filthy, stinking Jim Scudder will ever go to heaven is because Christ died for my sins. His life was lived consistently. He lived what he preached, but he really loved the gospel of grace. Where did he learn to love the clear gospel? James Scudder, born in Kentucky in 1946, was raised in a pastor's home but was not born again until he was a senior at the University of Kentucky. And that night they explained to me the gospel, that it's all by grace. The last thing he wanted to be was a pastor, until one day God led him to walk across a shallow river to find a man praying for a pastor. He looks at me and he said, are you the preacher I've been praying for? I said, yes, and that was my call to preach. Fired up for God, he and his friends enrolled at the Florida Bible College in Coconut Grove, Miami. There, he would meet his future wife, Linda, and get married. Then my sister Julie and I were born. But now what? Where would we go? What would we do? Dad loved the country life, but today, we'll hear the incredible story of God calling him and mom to the last place they would want to go, the big city. We begin part three of Finish Strong at the second location of the Florida Bible College in Hollywood, Florida. It's hard to imagine the difference between that property in Coconut Grove and this property right on the beach. Can you imagine when we were from that and we came into this the first time, it was like, wow. And we had a place there that would seat a couple thousand people. And you were also baptized, right? I was here. baptized here. Biggest baptistry, I think, in the in world. Because all oceans connect. <laughs> this was such a step up for you guys, but you still had that same excitement. It wasn't about the location. The excitement didn't change. And now we're really growing, though. You imagine putting this on your college brochure? Our president fell in a moral sin. I really believe when he fell, the college was up to 1,600 students. I believe it would have been the biggest Bible college the world's ever seen. But when he fell, man, it was, that was a hard day in my life. There were a lot of students that wanted to quit. There are a lot of students, they did quit. Mm -hmm. You also had to make a decision when you heard the news that this hero of yours had fallen. What are you going to do? Well, my decision is, am I going to quit? And it finally hit me, well, I'm not following a man, I'm following Christ. And Christ didn't quit. Why would I quit? So I decided not to quit. Dad's decision not to quit so early on in our family's journey was critical to finishing strong, as many more hardships would come our way. But on a lighter note, I remember Dad telling me a funny story that happened during his Bible college days about his buddy, Bill Adams, being paranoid about someone following him. One time, I saw him putting a body into a trunk. Turned out it was a murder that 
place, and I'm the only eyewitness, not to the murder, but to the body. So now they said, we want you to come, and they said, we're going to give you protection, but you're not allowed to tell any of your roommates. And poor Bill Adams, you know, he kept saying, someone's following me. I said, Bill, your imagination's running wild. It's not my imagination. Everywhere I go, I'm being followed. And I can remember I'd come home and I'd say, Jim, do you feel like there's something going on? <laughs> and he just, nah, it's a regular day. You know, of course, he couldn't tell me. So he went home for Christmas. I knew there was something going on, and I was, I was so scared. I got me a, a big old butcher knife. <laughs> And I, I put it by my bed every night because I knew something was going on. We laugh at that so much, him sleeping with a butcher knife out and all that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. I just couldn't believe it, you know. And I was born right along the way. It's always a tragedy. Yeah. Nothing's yeah. perfect. But there's a great story about that. You were being born at the most expensive hospital in the state of Florida. Cedars of Lebanon. And everybody says, oh, you went to the wrong hospital. It's too expensive. So the, I was working at Brinks when your mom was going to have you. She insisted that I come. Now, I'm, I'm guarding over a billion dollars. I'm the only person. Wouldn't that be worth more than a billion dollars? Well, if I hadn't come, I, I shut the place and came. If they'd have found out, <laughs> I'd have been fired. But here's the amazing thing. You are born on the 23rd of December. They gave us a, a stocking. You came out early Christmas morning. Now, we had to have 600 before you went in. And boy, that was scraping, borrowing, and working overtime. So we had it. And then whatever else we'd have to pay, no insurance. And I was expecting another three to 4,000. And I get from the hospital and they refunded us from the $600 is a refund of $60. So you were a cheap baby. <laughs> You've been cheap ever since. <laughs> but you were pretty exhausted, right? Still going to college and doing the night shift. I was so tired and doing 72 hour and then doing, you know, 15 to 17 hours in college. And I was taking, I was taking Greek and systematic. Both of those are very difficult, especially when you're working day and night. I would sit in class, literally, and this is not a joke, and I'd hold my one eye open. And Dr. Mark Cameron, who later became one of my best friends, he said, I just would look at you and say, why are you even here? I remember you told some stories about Brinks where somebody pulled a gun on the police. This guy he had a sawed-off shotgun. All of us had gotten shot at least once. And, you know, it's pretty scary. So the Miami police did not like Brinks having sawed-off shotguns. So they came up to him and said, we're going to take your shotgun. And... Kaiser said, no, you're not. He said, you're not taking my shotgun. He said, which of you want to die first? Oh, my goodness. And we're surrounded by the Miami police, the Brinks. They got the bullhorns. They're saying to come out. And Kaiser just would not surrender. We're trying to get him to surrender so we don't get shot in this thing. And he won't surrender. Well, in the midst of all that, I kept trying to lead him to Christ. I said, now, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Who, who is the world? And Kaiser would say, that's you and me. They gave him only begotten. Who's that? Jesus. That whosoever, who's that? He says, you or me. Believeth in him. Who's that? That's Christ. Should not perish. What does that mean? Go to hell but have everlasting life. What does that mean? Heaven. Do you believe that? Yes. Well, then, are you going to be in heaven? He said, no, I'm going to be in hell. I must have done that 30, 40 times. And then all of a sudden, he sees it. The lights come on. 
And he says, I'm going to heaven. If I'm going to heaven, what's it matter, those policemen out there? And he surrendered. Wow. They taught us at Florida Bible. Don't get in an argument. Stay on the gospel. Stay on the gospel. And that was a huge emphasis at Florida Bible College and has been in your ministry and now our ministry is the gospel needs to stay clear. You know, son, I see so many good preachers and they preach really good, but they don't have a clue. I call them the, the flip-floppers. One week, it's all by grace. The next week, if you don't have works, you're not saved. And they mix up James and they say, faith without works is dead, but it's all by grace, not by works. And it's just flip-flop, 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 you know? And it's so sad because they don't understand the gospel. Do you want to finish strong? Contact me right now and I'll send you this Finish Strong commemorative bookmark for free. Then every time you open your Bible, you'll be reminded that God wants you to never give up. Call our unforgettable number 1-800-78-GRACE or order on our secure website ingrace.tv. You will also be blessed when you read Dr. Scudder's amazing autobiography and watch this four-part full-length DVD series. Support the work that he started, and let's all finish strong. And you graduated. Yes. And you ended up in Chicago of all places. Well, I did not want to go to Chicago. You know, other guys are dating and I'm going fishing. I had a boat that I tied up below the Kentucky Dam and I was just happy and I was not going to go to Chicago. So I go by this student union place and they have a guy in there and he has uh, markers where all the graduates were. I said, well, why is nobody in Chicago? He said, no one will go there. Hmm. Well, you know, I didn't know there's Moody and this. I, I didn't ever heard of Moody. You know, I was just out of the forest I came. And that kind of bothered me a lot that no one would go there. And I said, no, we're not going there because you and your sister were still in diapers. You were only 13 at the time. Yeah, let's correct that. <laughs> let's correct that right now. Okay, no, you were... You I were, mean, why don't you just say we were really little? Why do we have to say diapers on well, national television? Well, I, I think, have a reputation, though. Okay. I know, but people appreciate... <laughs> I know they do. <laughs> but I get to edit the show, too. So hopefully yeah, we'll cut that out. Yeah, you probably won't put that on there. That was my excuse. Two babies in diapers, and I still had a $600 school bill. Dr. Cameron, now he's talking to all the graduates. Now remember, he didn't know me from beans. He, he did not know my story. He just thought I was a guy holding my eye on, but that's all he knew about me. And he gets in there and he says, God wants you to go most of the time where you don't want to go. I think, what's he saying? He said, I don't care, and he says, if you have two babies in diapers and you have a college bill. Those were our two criteria, school bills and babies in diapers. And then you might have that and you think you're gonna have to have a salary, but maybe God's leading you to go somewhere else. Your mom was sitting with me and we walked out. We both just said, yeah, we're going to Chicago. Hmm. It was amazing how our minds you know, went to that right away. Next thing you know, we're taking a Volkswagen, no boxes just piled up, and we got two Cadillacs that were, you drive and they pay the fuel. And So your dad wasn't real happy that you were taking us to Chicago. No, he, you know, he wanted his grandkids to be close to him. And he, all he knew was Al Capone and shooting everybody. And he said, James, I don't have much money. I'm very poor. But what I have, I give you everything if you don't take those kids to Chicago. Mm -hmm. 
I said, Dad, God's called us to Chicago and we're going. And he drove one of the cars. And we got out of the car and he says, James, I knew you were lost. I told you we'd be lost. Where are we? You know, and, and your dad just turned to him and said, this is where we're coming. We're here. This is it. <laughs> and we got there and they had bars on the windows. And I said, well, why are there bars on the windows? And he just looked at me. You'll learn. And it's a very dangerous area. You know, our vision was when we first came to Chicago, we would have a thousand people our first year. Now, was that? I and mean, that, I've heard you say that and dad yeah. say that, but is that really what you guys thought? We often did think that. Yeah. Yeah. We just thought if, you know, like it just can happen, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I don't know. I guess we really didn't read enough missionary books or something. Well, it didn't, it didn't happen <laughs> that way. It eventually did, but yes, it took it 45 did. years. Yes. You know, in the first year, I hadn't even found a place to meet yet, and it just didn't go well. And then we finally got a, a storefront, and we started meeting, and it was so slow. And One time, a gang in Chicago called the Jousters, and most of the Jousters all came to one service. And, you know, I was young and so sincere. They just, they just listened. And that day, we had about 40 hands of the jousters raised for salvation. And I said, wow, we're the fastest growing church in the world. We went from two to 42. <laughs> Next Sunday, none came back. We were the fastest declining church in the world. <laughs> up and down, up and down. So many times you want to quit, but you just keep plowing because Jesus never quit. <laughs> I remember there's some stories about where we used to live and what we didn't have. We were the fourth floor. Now, they didn't have elevators, of course. And it was a really bad place. I mean, I was so afraid that you guys were going to fall out a window, fourth floor. So we went to Salvation Army and bought two card tables. And then we had these chairs that folded. But they were the kind that if you sat back too far, they just folded up, you know. So we had a Thanksgiving dinner once, and we invited Leroy Geron over. Who was your first member? Yeah. And we were bound and determined because you could buy a turkey for, you know, what, 20 cents a pound or something in those days. We roasted it and brought it out, and we get ready to set it on the table. And I'm looking at this table, and I go, I don't think... It's probably like 26 pound turkey. I said, I don't think that's gonna, you know, support it. So your dad decides to put it on the chair. So when you put it on the chair, then the whole thing flipped. The turkey goes flying across the floor, dumps over onto the floor. Now we still ate it. We were so poor, we had to eat it. That day, Leroy went and bought us a real table. Mm. You start meeting and it's me and Julie, mom and you and Leroy, and I think Ralph. Then Ralph, Ralph Kowalski entered the scene somewhere. He became a faithful member. You know, he had a lot of physical issues and he had bumps all over, but we loved him. And that was one of my first shocks when he died. I was over in India. Boy, that was a hard one. Faithful though, you know, didn't have a lot of ability, but he was faithful. He was faithful. He became our, our custodian. He lived there in the building, and he was so faithful. Because of the encouragement of those early church members and dad and mom's determination and perseverance, the little church they planted would slowly grow into a large, energetic, and dedicated church. And that church would impact the world with the gospel. Next time, we'll hear about some amazing miracles that God did for us during that growth. I owe so much to Dr. Scudder, and I'm so grateful that he asked me as a 17-year-old boy to come to Bible college. And he often said, you can't do everything, but you can do something. And he, he lived that way. Every moment of his life was to reach someone else with the gospel.
The gospel of grace made all the difference in my dad's life. As he graduated Bible college and began the ministry that grew into such an amazing thing, it was always based on salvation by grace. And if you don't understand grace at salvation, you won't be able to live for the Lord. You won't be able to serve the Lord because we're always gonna fear, well, maybe I'm gonna mess up and maybe God's gonna take away my salvation. But dad learned when he was young, he was in Bible college, that the gospel is grace. And actually, we, we also live by grace. We serve by grace. It's all by God's grace. You know, my dad always had verses on the back wall of the auditorium. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, his life verses. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let this represent you and me, and this represents sin. He would put his wallet in his, in his hand, and he would say, we all have sinned. And that's true, and, and a lot of people think they can get rid of their sin by being good. The Bible says that our best efforts to God is nothing but filthy rags. But then my dad would say, let this hand represent Jesus. Jesus came, the Son of God. He did many great miracles, proving that he was God, but he died sinless. He died for our sins on the cross. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. So many people think I have to earn eternal life or it's Jesus plus my works, but my dad said no. He learned that it's by grace that you're saved through faith. It's not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. So what do you have to do to receive a gift? Just take it. How do you receive salvation? By faith, just believe that Jesus died for you. The Son of God died in your place on a cross. And my dad never had to fear the grave because he knew for sure he was on his way to heaven. He was born again. Have you been born again? This would be a great opportunity to put your trust in Jesus Christ. Do you want to finish strong? Contact me right now and I'll send you this Finish Strong commemorative bookmark for free. Then every time you open your Bible, you'll be reminded that God wants you to never give up. Call our unforgettable number 1-800-78-GRACE or order on our secure website, ingrace.tv. You will also be blessed when you read Dr. Scudder's amazing autobiography and watch this four-part full-length DVD series. Support the work that he started, and let's all finish strong.